All right, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Watch and Listen. Today, we're going to nerd out. Cameron, are you ready to nerd out? Yeah, always. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm literally special. like, yes, yes, exactly. And I'm like, I'm going to I'm gonna take your powers and I'm going to harness them right now because, like, seriously, this is, I'm actually pretty excited to do this episode because uh, this is one episode that I think that I can learn quite a lot. Uh, I know how to get around, you know, the whole watch world just a little bit, but when it comes to the real geeky technical stuff, I need a little bit of help. So uh, you're going to mentor us including myself today. So when you're ready, let's get started. Yeah, definitely. Okay, good deal. So on this episode, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how a watch actually works. I guess the first thing that we could talk about, and this is something that I was telling you earlier that I Googled, I was Googling the pronunciation. Is it, it's a, a Bosch, right? Um, yes. The, and th- that doesn't really translate to like a, a watch movement or anything. Right. Uh, in particular, that's a very specialized, um, when you mention that in the watch realm, mm-hmm. that's very specialized. It, it essentially means a base kit right. for a watch movement. Right. It is not a watch movement. Okay. So can you explain that a little bit further? Like, what is the base kit? Because if you do the direct translation of that word, it says it's, it's, it translates to draft. So what does that mean? So in the watch world... We consider that to be uh, the components that make up a movement prior to being finished. Okay. So this is not a movement that's been disassembled. This is a movement before it's been turned into, or these are the components that will become a movement. So these are fresh off the machines. Okay. Okay. Machined, but they have not been finished. Got it. So you have not... um, decorated bridges you have not jeweled main plates you have not uh fitted other pre-assemblies together got this it. is prior to any of that got it uh, so to go from that to a movement is a huge step right so basically just to kind of layman it out a little bit more what you're getting suppose you order uh any bosch uh or a bosch whatever from let's say would you order it from like swatch like an ETA or a Salida or, you know, an Eterna movement or something like that. Is that where you're ordering these from? Uh, it depends who you are, uh-huh. but yes, you would order it from the company that manufactures those components or compiles all of the contracted manufactured components and then sells the kit. Got it. So there's an extra layer of very like- large, large bulk. This right. is, you know, Big, big orders. You don't call up an order one. They don't, uh, they don't do that. <laughs> right. So let's say like a company like Bauman Mercier, right? The majority of their movements, I think they have an in-house movement, but I could be wrong. But the majority of their movements are going to be sourced from other places. And we're talking about not just the bridges and the jewels, but we're talking about like uh, balance springs and things like that. Those are going to come from a different supplier, right? Or if you're buying like the whole kit, it comes from one entity. There's nobody that makes the whole kit. Okay. All right. Okay. There are only companies that compile a kit. Got it. Okay. They do not manufacture every component that goes into the kit. Right. Um, There's just too many specialties. Okay. Everyone likes to pretend they make everything. Right. Sure. But (laughs) it's just not the case. Right. Okay. So let's say if I were to start a watch company tomorrow and I'm like, I want to place an order for, let's say, I don't know, 30,000 Ibosh kits. So I would they'll, contact. They'll laugh you out the door. Okay. Well. All right. Well. Thirty thousand is too too few. <laughs> too few? Really? <laughs> yeah. What? What's like? What's yeah. an entry number? Well, because because of the nature of the supply chains, uh-huh. there's very little excess in the supply chain. So you typically need to work with much larger producers, um, which is why a company like like Etta, uh-huh. which essentially they own some some component manufacturers and they also contract out to other component manufacturers and they bring all of those parts together to create a kit for an automatic movement or a manual wind movement or a chronograph. And that kit they then sell to a company like Breitling or uh, one of these larger companies that has the uh, necessary skill Mm -hmm. and the people to go through and decorate and finish and assemble and jewel. Uh, Or you could simply have those kits sent to an assembler, which is another specialty. And they will 
decorate and assemble your movements for you. Uh, and then they could send them to another contractor that puts dials and hands on them and cases them up and does your quality control, your final quality control on finished watches and then sends them to you. Got so it. it just depends how involved you want to be in all of those technical aspects. Um, the, the more involved you are, obviously much larger overhead, many more employees, uh, much more equipment, all of that, um, which gives you a little more flexibility, mm -hmm. but it's also very, very expensive. Sure. <laughs> sure. Makes total sense. But I mean, it's, in essence, what you could do is if you really wanted to, you could basically be just a brand, right? And exactly. you could outsource everything. So you could yeah. just have your like sales department and your marketing team. And that's all you have. You're not really a watch manufacturer. You're basically a brand and you you're buying watches from someone who's actually manufacturing. Well, you're, I would, I would still argue that you're a manufacturer. Okay. Because right. you, without you, there would be no finished product. Right. Uh, you're the one who designed it and you're the one who uh, orchestrated all of the creation and the assembly and, and every part that was manufactured. Mm hmm. Um, so I'd still put you in the manufacturer cattle, uh, category. Um, the difference is how quick you can pivot and come up with a new design. Sure. You know, but I think uh, I mean, we're getting a little off topic, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Quite I a think bit. a lot of people are interested in that because yeah. having your own watch company for a lot of people who love watches, uh, it sounds like this amazing fantasy world uh, and really with the with the with enough uh with enough passion and money <laughs> yeah i would think the latter is probably more important there's enough there's enough uh enough contractors out there in the world who really know how to make the best parts and do the best assembly and the best quality control they can really do that and if you have an awesome idea and the money behind it, you can create an amazing watch brand. Yeah. Which is pretty cool that there's that many uh, uh, great contractors out there. Right. Unfortunately, we don't have those contractors in the U.S. <laughs> That's fine. We <laughs> have you. So much myself. Yeah, exactly. We have you. So you yeah. got to start somewhere, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, now that we've talked about that, let's actually talk about like, let's say when you actually get your pieces together, right? And I don't know how it comes in a little box and whichever way that they send it over to you via FedEx, UPS, whichever. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and actually now break it all apart and let's talk about where you start. So my understanding is you probably start from the base plate, right? So it really depends what you're doing. If you're buying somebody else's design, mm -hmm and somebody else's engineering, okay. then you're going to get a kit that you, um, and there's a little more flexibility because there are other people who have already worked with that kit for other brands. So you can have that finished at many different workshops in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially what you'll have is a, a set of raw parts that if assembled, probably uh, just assembled won't be very good they have to be finished properly um like anything else the cnc machines that create these parts they're only so perfect right will have flaws and within those kits they should have already been quality controlled so that you know your main tolerances the really important things that if they're off your your watch has no way of working that should already be controlled so okay. you should start with a good kit that's been controlled already, but everything that leads to added value, such as a certain polishing technique used on your wheels or uh, a certain decoration you put on the edge of the bridges, these things are all value added. Hmm. Some companies could choose to simply throw all of those parts in a tumbler and get a nice, even, uh, matte looking finish on every part, mm -hmm. do the assembly, uh, well plate it and then do the assembly and stick it in a watch mm -hmm. and it'll be reliable and solid. And, uh, it will be inexpensive relatively. 
There are other companies who want to add more of the hand finishing for certain decorations, which might require a whole crew of people to do different um, circular grains on a wheel and polished uh, um, polished chamfers on your spokes and things like that of the wheel. Or some will gold plate the wheels and then they will actually remove the gold plating from the teeth so that you don't have any gold plating that flakes off in the movement. All of these little things, that's up to the next people that get the movement. Right. The, the Ibosh. The next people that get it, they will determine exactly what they want to do to it to make it their own and make it special and make it fit within their brand and within their price point. Uh, a lot of it has to do with price point. Right. Yeah, sure. It makes total sense. Let's bring it back a little bit. Let's get a little bit more granular on the actual parts of the watch. So like, I, what I want to do is I want to talk about the importance of what each bit in the movement does and how they all cohesively work together to make sure that you're, you've got something that is able to tell time and it's able to tell, tell time accurately. So like with, with regard to the base plate, the base plate is essentially the foundation, right? Because is it like, and correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but it, it, for my assumption is, is you've got a piece of metal, right? Which has your grooves and it's cut out and, um, you know, to place the particular parts in there. And that basically is your foundation. Without the base plate, you're probably not going to be able to put the movement together. Is that where it really starts? Like, let's assume that, we're just doing the most simple, like, let's let's assume that we're doing work at um, Weiss Watch, you know. You've got all your parts milled, machined, finished, serv- uh, uh, coated, whatever. So you've got your, your, your uh, watchmaker's table. Do you start with the base plate? Um, you don't always have to start with the base plate as far as, like, finishing and things like that. Mm-hmm. But your base plate is one of the most complex components that goes into the movement. Mm-hmm. Um. So it is essential that it is perfect. Right. Uh, it's one of the more expensive components, and it is one of the harder components to create simply because of the tolerances okay. and all of the features that are in a main plate. If you have one, one part that needs one hole drilled in it, uh, you can get that done pretty accurately. Okay. When you have one part that is the same size and has 25 holes drilled in it, making sure that every hole is the exact distance it needs to be from the next hole and little errors not stacking up from hole to hole. Right. That is the problem. So if that you can see, can you see the, uh, the, the graphic that I just pulled up? Can you see that on your screen? I cannot. You can't. Okay, let's see if... Let me check and see if I can change my view. Okay, let's do that. Because I've got... I've pulled up a graphic here, and basically it's got the main... So is the base... Like, saying base plate, that's incorrect? So it's the main plate? That's the more correct version? Or the more correct way of saying it? Okay. Yeah, main plate. Okay. So, and and obviously it sounds like main, and, and that is... It's pretty literal. Like, that is the core piece. That is the piece that everything is built off of. Essentially, yes. Got it. Okay. If... If you had a movement, the uh, it, the main plate is so complex that if you were to restore an old timepiece, mm-hmm. that would be one of the parts that would take the longest to recreate. It would be the biggest job you could potentially have would be replacing the main plate. Right. Um, now, with larger production, you could, of course, just order... And with a modern day watch, you would just order a new main plate uh, from the manufacturer, but this would be something vintage. Okay. So having a solid main plate as your foundation, uh, where all the tolerances are super tight Mm -hmm. because they have to be, since you have so many different features on one small area, uh, that's going to make for easy final assembly and fitting of other components. Yeah. And it makes sense because if your main plate isn't done properly, then you have to re like you have to completely redo every other component. Like you have to redo all the cogs and like everything. I'm yeah. assuming. So I mean, think about think about someone that does work in a house or something like that. If you've got crooked walls or a sloped floor, right, which is the majority every, of buildings in California, that but point, you're you know installing kitchen cabinets and trying to make them look level, but 
if they're too level, then they're going to look weird with your floor that's crooked. Uh, you know, hanging a picture on a wall where your baseboards aren't level. And so you try and start with a really solid, nearly perfect uh, main plate, right. which is why they're very expensive, very hard to manufacture. Um, and usually there is a special manufacturer just for the main plate. Okay. The follow-up question about the main plate. So what, what is the, the key function outside of obviously putting everything in place uh, that the main plate does for the watch, like for timekeeping? It really has nothing to do with those small technical aspects of the watch. Uh, and it has everything to do with providing a strong base. Uh, watches that have a really powerful mainspring. Mm-hmm might require more robust bridges. Okay. Because you have more wound up power with a much stronger spring that wants to rip itself apart. Um, so the more power you're putting in there, which is why if you look at clocks or pocket watches, you're going to have much thicker main plates and bridges than you will in a small wristwatch. Uh, okay. simply because the larger components moving around require a heavier duty spring. And that means you need a stronger foundation to keep things from warping or twisting or essentially ripping itself apart. Got it. So the main plane is, is basically, it's the entire structure, right? Is that accurate to say? Because you're talking about bridges now. So is that a part of the main plate or you know, how does that work? The main plate is your main level of the watch. Mm -hmm. You are then going to have a movement side and a dial side. The dial side is where you're going to have things like your calendar functions. You're going to have your winding and setting. Um, you may have other things like power reserves and uh, perpetual calendars and, and whatnot. All of these additions can go on the dial side. Okay. Because they are translating what your hands are doing on the dial side mm -hmm. into additional features. Okay. For wheels and extra pivots and, and extra extra parts, essentially. Got it. Okay. So if you move to the movement side, which uh -huh. is the back side of the watch from your main plate, right. you're going to stack all of your gear train in there, which is going to be wheels, and, um, and then you're going to have your barrel with the main spring in it, all of those components. And the thing that's going to keep those in place, those will be your bridges. Got it. And you've seen this before. You've seen where, let's say, a movement, like, let's let's talk about maybe, like, pro prototyping, and like, where the mainspring is actually strong enough to wreck the movement. What kind of, what kind of issues have you seen with stuff like this? Because you're talking about, like, pressures and forces that are going to rip apart, you know, bits and pieces of steel, albeit very thin bits and pieces of steel, but still. Yeah, well, you... You should never see that. It right. should never get well, to the. Hopefully, there should never be a watch movement that was engineered um, that poorly, mm -hmm. where the spring is too powerful for the uh, structure. Uh, it would be similar to putting, you know, a thousand horsepower in your uh, Volkswagen Beetle. Sure. If you don't reinforce your frame, <laughs> right. And a lot of other components, you're just going to start shredding things. Yeah. Hit the gas and just parts are sh like, there's no teeth left on, on your transmission. Like everything's just shearing and breaking loose because you put too much power in your vehicle. Right. Um, so that's what happens. It, it's all engineered together. Okay. So there's basically what you're saying is there is a maximum size or whatever it is, or strength of a mainspring. And we'll get to that actually later. Uh, for each movement that is designed. So let's say, let, let's say like a 2892 or a 6497, right? These are two basic movements that come from ETA. Uh, so you, you're not going to be able, let's say if you want to put like a, I don't know, what's, what's the biggest power reserve that you could put in a 6497? How many days? Like eight days? Um, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's a weird question. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you could potentially take the gear train and you could change, you could re-engineer your main plate and bridges 
to accept multiple barrels. Mm, okay. So you would make a larger main plate that has space to add a second barrel. Uh, and this would be something you would do. And, and you could have a special version of your ETA 6497 movement that would have twin barrels and a longer, longer uh, um, reserve. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to Google this as you're talking because I would love to see if someone's ever done a double barrel 6497. Have you ever heard of that before or no? I've seen them done in uh, school watches. Okay. Let's see, let's see, let's see. It's already a large movement, though. Yeah, yeah, so that's what I was thinking. The ideal, <clears throat> it's not the ideal watch to do that with. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, there are many complications like that that can be uh, integrated into existing movements by either modifying the existing main plate, which companies that do that would be purchasing the kit and then uh, modifying that main plate to accept certain things, or they would purchase that kit without the main plate and they would make their own main plate or whatever they have to do to, to make it exactly what they want. Okay. So you're reverse engineering. Okay. It makes sense. What, what's a better movement to do that in? Like, let's say if you wanted to add some barrels or whatever. Um, 2892, is that better? I mean, it seems more modern. So you would think. Not really. Okay. There's, I mean, it's, it's not an ideal solution for any existing movement. I know it's, it's a weird answer, but it's also <laughs> an odd question. Um, I mean, there are things you would look for, and there's just too much you'd have to change. Right. It wouldn't make sense. Well, the reason I ask this question is, you know, you see different manufacturers that are throwing in, like, double barrels and 48-hour power reserves and, like, eight days and then whatever and whatever. So you would think, like, a lot of these movements are coming from the same place. It's not like they're completely re revamping or completely uh, making a brand new movement. Like, the Panerai 8-day, I think, is that, that's a base, I think it's based on something, right? I, I don't think that was a completely new movement. So what that, what's actually happening there... Mm -hmm is you take an existing gear train. Okay. Everything else is new. Hmm. It's a unique design. So you utilize the existing gear train from possibly a 7750 at a movement, and you utilize the escapement from that movement, and then you build the rest of the watch around that. Okay. That's how, mo uh, that's how most of the unique movements from Swiss brands come to be. Um, hmm. The gear train is something that has been perfected over hundreds of years with really the, the ideal um, ratios and tooth profiles and all of these little details being perfected like a hundred years ago. Okay. So, it's, so uh, okay. <laughs> really want to re-engineer that. There's not much gain. Right. That could be, uh, that could be made. So yes, if you change your main plate and bridges, you can usually use an existing gear train mm -hmm. and add things like, uh, dual barrels, or uh, you can also change your beat rate, which would give you a different power reserve because your watch is unwinding at a different rate. Uh -huh. uh, you can also simply create a different main plate that has more features on the front side of it, on the dial side, so that you can add things like calendars and power reserves and, uh, and other dial side mounted complications okay all right that makes sense that makes sense let's talk about like the actual power transmission so i'm going to pull up this graphic again so you could see um that they basically there's the uh mainspring there's the wheel train and then the escapement so that's the basic functionality of it so let's assume that we have a movement that has two mainsprings right double barrel how does the power transmission work is it is it like getting power at the same time from both barrels or is like one barrel supposed to completely deplete its power and then it goes to the second barrel. How does that transmission work, and how is it seamless? Because I would think, like, 
these are still mechanical parts and you still have to regulate yeah. them some way somehow. Yeah, so what you'll what you'll usually have is in, in a dual barrel setup, um, you're either going to have stacked barrels or you're going to have barrels on the same plane. Okay. The barrels are going to unwind uh, together. Okay. Makes right. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're unwinding so at the same time. One barrel unwinding, and then some special clutch mechanism kicks in and, right. and allows the other barrel to unwind. Watch movement. Okay. Would you have a you have a a movement specifically that maybe you can throw my way that I could pull up for people to see? Actually, here I found a a Jorn resonance. Actually, no, that's a resonance doesn't have dual barrels. I don't think it has dual. He's a, he's a horrible example because he does so much weird shit. Uh, <laughs> so much special. Uh. And like, I guess I'd say inventions. Yeah, uh, I guess is so. Really, I mean, invenit deficit or whatever. Right. Uh, he's essentially inventing new ways of doing things. So he's not a great example as far as saying what the industry generally does and what's available out there, because the way he achieves uh, a, a certain complication is a very different way than uh, Rolex or. Brightling or you know more mainstream brands would would utilize right yeah he's a but mad scientist for sure that, that it's not okay to look at his watches and, and say like whoa that's a, a cool double barrel movement yeah a little bit a little bit more difficult to break down though yes <laughs> okay yeah well I found one here it's a Meister Singer it looks like it's dual barrel so okay so basically just to, to what you were talking about it's it's going to deplete them at the same time the the energy source is going to come out equally. Uh, so that's that. I mean, it sounds like that that presents a pretty strong challenge there. How do you make sure that the barrels are, um, you know, transmitting energy at the same equal time? Like, you, like I said, you're still dealing with a material here. What's inside the barrel? I mean, the the main spring. What's it, what's the material that you, it usually is made out of? Uh, you have a, a coiled spring. Mm -hmm. It's a, a special alloy. Depends on who the manufacturer is, uh, and that will determine what alloy you're you're purchasing. Right. Um, but you're going to have a coiled spring. So this is it right here. You're going to have your barrel and then you're going to have, uh, the center of your barrel, mm -hmm. which is the part that is actually going to wind. Okay. Makes sense. So when you turn the crown and you wind up your watch yep. or your automatic mechanism is spinning uh -huh. and winding up your watch, it is actually turning the center of your barrel, which is attached to the center of your mainspring. Okay. To wind up the inside internally. Got it. And slowly, over time, the outside of the barrel will turn. Mm -hmm. And that is what advances your hour hand and minute hand and second hand. Gotcha. And whatever other hands you have on your watch or dates and functions and things. So that's okay. how the power transmission inside of your barrel takes place. Okay. All right. Fair. All right. So that answers my question about the barrels. Let's see what else I got. I got a bunch of stuff written down. Uh, okay. All right. So let's talk about like efficiency of the barrels, right? Let's do single barrel, double barrel, doesn't matter. Uh, and we can go back to like a six, four, nine, seven movement, which is pretty easy to dissect. And you know, it's, it's a pretty straightforward movement. Um, so when it comes to beat rates, like you can adjust beat rates pretty much every movement, right? As long as you like, it's, it's the beat rate's mostly the escapement, right? No, wrong. Okay, explain. Uh, so your beat rate has to work with your gear trade. Mm -hmm. If you change your beat rate, your gear train won't move. Uh, at the proper rate. Okay. Right. It makes sense because oh. you've got the teeth, bigger teeth, smaller teeth. Um, not so much the, the size of the tooth mm -hmm. as the number of the teeth. Right, right, right. That's what so I was saying. So what you're trying to do is get your hour hand to go once around your dial mm -hmm. every 12 hours. Okay. I'm actually going to pull up a Zenith El Primero because the teeth on a Zenith El Primero... Well, that's going to be different because you're going to be looking at the uh, the teeth on the chronograph wheel. Uh -huh. 
those are very small. Okay. Um, what I'm talking about is your actual gear ratios. Okay. So wheel to pinion to wheel to pinion to wheel to pinion until you reach your cannon pinion, mm -hmm. which is what your minute hand is going to rest on. Okay. You need to make sure that your cannon pinion is going to rotate uh, once every hour. So if you have the same gear train and you change your beat rate by putting in a different uh, balance wheel and hairspring, okay, you will change how far that out that minute hand goes around your dial in one hour. Makes sense. Okay, it might only go around thirty minutes in one hour. Right. So then you'd have to create some wacky dial <laughs> to make up for that if that was your goal, you know? Sure. Wait. So when you try and increase the beat rate or decrease your beat rate, you are going to need to change out something in your gear train. Uh -huh. Change out the pinion on your escape wheel or change out one of the wheels in the, in the going train um, so that you maintain the same ratio from your balance wheel oscillations all the way through to your cannon pinion where your minute hand is is moving around. Got it. And the cannon pinion is right in the middle of the movement, right? Because I mean, thinking about kind of where it's supposed to go, right? If it's connected to the hour so, hand. So in the 6497's case, uh -huh. yes, cannon pinion is attached directly to uh, what is known as the great wheel or center wheel. Okay. There are other movements where your cannon pinion is in a different location. It is not centered, and you will have an additional wheel on the front of your movement uh, that then translates that to your minute hand. Okay. So it does not have to be in the center of your watch, but you eventually want to put your minute hand in the center of your watch. So you will use another wheel to move that. So it's very flexible. If, if you had a movement and you wanted to change it so that maybe you have a regulator display uh -huh. where your hours and minutes and seconds are all on different uh, locations, you could take a movement that has all of those hands in the center and you could actually add a thin wheel on the dial side to translate that movement to say uh, let's let's put it midway between 12 and the center for your hours and then let's put a minute display right in the center and then put your seconds down between the center and six okay you can do whatever you want just by adding different wheels um, you just have to maintain the ratios that are necessary to make sure that the transfer makes your uh makes the hand spin as many times as you want okay and sometimes you'll see watches that have uh maybe a second hand a sub second hand that only has 30 seconds on the dial and it's because it's going double speed right i've never it's seen that i've actually every 30 seconds maybe i have but uh do you have an example of something like that i, I can't remember anything that it was a 30 second. I mean, it's from a chronograph. Or um, I have seen them before. I don't remember who made them. What's but, the point yes, of something like that? Exist. Yeah. And you'll usually see that on a watch where they just want to, they don't have the necessary wheel in place to easily add a second hand. So hmm. what they do is it's more of a, more of a running indicator. Okay. So you can see the watch is running because <laughs> if you don't include a second hand, on a mechanical watch, uh, sometimes it's hard to tell. You have to sit there and go, okay, is the, is the minute hand moving? And you have to sit there to make sure that it's actually running right. before you know that your time is accurate. Right, right, right. Okay, makes sense. All right, well, let's talk about like the actual frequencies of it too. So uh, let's forget about the barrels and whatnot. Um, but let, let's talk about actual power transmission and efficiencies and things like that. Like 6497, what's, if you were to just leave a base 6497 movement alone, what's the power reserve on it? Like 48 hours if you were to crank it all the way up to 11? Yes, yeah, I 
It's about 46 hours. 46 hours. Okay. Yeah. So the for 6497, I think it's a three hertz movement. So it's what, 18, 18, eight in terms of uh, beat frequency? Yes. So there's a 6497-1. Okay. Which is what you're speaking of. There's also a 6497-2. Which is 21, which is a right? Beat rate version, which is a 216. Right. Beat okay. Rate. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the differences between those two. Why is there a difference? I mean, is there maybe uh, a difference in quality? I mean, why is the higher beat rate higher beat yeah. rate? I mean, what's what's going on there? So the the easiest way to look at beat rates is that you are breaking time down into a smaller increment. Mm-hmm. So the smaller your increment, uh, think of it like a measuring tape okay a measuring tape that has feet marked on it and only feet okay the only accurate measurement you're going to be able to take is one foot increments right so if you're measuring something less than a foot you're only going to know that it's like well it's within that one foot mark it's it's not nothing but it's not a foot uh if you have a measuring tape that has inches marked on it well now you can measure 12 increments or 11 between your foot Mm -hmm. so you can get a more accurate measurement if you then add fractions of an inch you know you might you might go down to a quarter inch sure you become a little more accurate right if you go down to eighth of an inch you're even more accurate so the more you're breaking down the, the measurement, the more accurate you can become. Okay. I mean, that makes total sense. So the higher the beat rate, it's kind of like having more increments, more measurements on your uh, measuring tape. Okay. So when you're doing a service on a watch, does that mean that it's easier to work on, let's say, that dash two movement, the 21600 movement, or the 18.8? No. Um, so your beat rate is going to not really affect much mm-hmm. until you get into what is considered a high beat rate. Right. Like the when Alpha Maros and the Seikos. Yeah, where you're dealing with, uh, with over, over 36,000 when you're, when you're getting up there. Uh, like El Primero and, and north of El Primero beat rates. Right that's where you're going to have some differences under that. It's really all pretty much the same. Um, if things are made well and all your parts are made well, potentially your higher beat rate watch will be more accurate. Mm -hmm. So that means by seconds per day. Sure. More accurate. Right. Okay. um, And a lower beat rate watch. When you get to higher beat rates, that means your parts are moving quicker. Okay. Well, yeah. It's beating faster. Right. So very essential parts are moving faster. Mm -hmm. So the higher the beat rate, you could start to potentially see some higher wear on those fast moving parts. Oh, okay. All right. So is that why Rolex, when they had the El Primero movement for the Daytonas, is that why they downgraded it? I mean, is that the right word to say it? Or downgraded it uh, to 28.8 yeah. as, as opposed to 36? I mean, I, I don't know exactly because I'm not Rolex. I'm not uh, within their uh, company. But yes, that you is was, yeah. probably why they chose to have the, the standard beat rate as opposed to a high beat rate. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, all things being equal, the higher beat rate is going to need service more frequently. And at the time that the El Primero came out, mm-hmm. they had issues. Uh, the oil, the oil technology at that point was not there, so the oil was actually being thrown from the escape wheel because the escape wheel was turning quickly, and the pallet fork and escape wheel are interacting at a very fast rate. So they were having issues keeping oil where it needed to be. Mm, okay. So basically it was just gunking up the entire movement and the entire movement would need service. Um, not so much gunking up the entire movement, but mm-hmm. they couldn't keep the oil where it needed to be. Right. 
so the parts would dry out quicker than they should. Oh, okay. So, okay. All right. I get it. Yeah. Okay. But oiling has caught up, and that's why you now see uh, higher beat rates. And also, not only has oiling caught up, but use of materials like silicon. Okay. Yeah. Which are technically do not need oil. Uh, so you can have them move fast and doesn't matter. They don't need oil. So you don't have to worry about extra wear and tear. You don't have to worry about the things that, that we had to worry about before having silicon parts. Gotcha. So before you would have to place a little bit of oil on a regular, or let's not even say before. I mean, there's still plenty of escapements that are not silicon escapements. So the silicon is escapements don't need oil work, whereas these traditional, let's say like, again, we'll, we'll go back to the traditional like 2892s and the Unitas 6497s that usually don't have silicon escapements. I mean, they, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that there's an option to bring that in there. Is there? So I'm thinking like Omega because Omega would use a 2892 base, right? And they have their their silicon escapements. So Omega is a a strange example, okay? Because they are part of the Swatch Group, mm -hmm. which has a lot of control over ETA um, because of their ownership, right? they have the ability to do changes that nobody else can get done. Yeah, yeah. Well, they own so the company, Omega, so yeah. Omega was able to create ETA movements with coaxial escapements yeah. inside of them. They were able to then modify everything and change it so that they have Omega movements. They're able to, to create silicon components and, and do all of this because they have all that shared knowledge within their group and shared use of facilities and, and people and all of that. Um, but back to the question about the, the oils. Yes, your standard pallet fork and escape wheel in, I don't know what it is exactly, but in 99% <laughs> of all mechanical watches will require oil. Okay, and now you're you're putting the oil right on top of the pallet, right? So basically, where the the ruby is, or the jewel is, ruby, um, you you actually have to oil that cog, right? So you can either oil the escape teeth directly, uh -huh. or you can oil the jewels directly on the pallet, or the or what is what is the actual pallet fork, right? Okay, yeah, on the pallet fork. Okay. All right, and that's the beauty of the coaxial, right? Is you don't have to oil it, right? Hmm. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of the George Daniels right, right. coaxial escapement, which is not the Omega coaxial escapement. Right, right. And, and the reason it's because the, and correct me if I'm wrong, again, I think the George Daniels one was obviously is it was easier to produce in smaller numbers. And Omega has to scale it up, so they actually had to kind of adjust a little bit, and that's why the oils came in. Obviously, for for scale, right? George Daniels, um, his coaxial escapement is different from what Omega produced. Uh huh. They started with his escapement, and then they made some some changes that led them to have to oil the escapement. Okay. Uh, his initial designs did not require oil, but there were some things that they, that Omega just couldn't implement um, when they were manufacturing the coaxial escapement. One of them being a gold escape wheel. Right. So they had to change the material because they didn't want to use gold. So with changing the material, that changes a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, as as you see, you can go from steel to silicon. And eliminate oil. Right. So going from gold to steel also changes it uh, when you're dealing with the coaxial, especially when that has something to do with the amount of friction on those uh, those teeth and on the jewels. Right. And let's not make this completely about the coaxial because we're going to do an episode on the coaxial. But uh, we're talking about the, one of the beauties of the coaxial is, again, that friction aspect, right? Because more friction equals, uh, I'm assuming, uh, less accuracy. And obviously, more friction means that you are going to have more wear and tear on the, the parts. Am I tracking here? Am I in the right kind of track? 
Yeah. You, you want to have as little friction as possible mm-hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, less friction means less oil. Uh huh. So it all comes uh, down to the oil. The oils, I, you, you would think that it's not that important, but it's, it sounds like it's hugely important. I mean, if not one of the most important things. Yeah. Well, and the reason oil is important is because friction exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we had a world where there was no friction, you could make a perfect watch without oil. Right. But because we have friction, we need to have a perfect oil. Mm. And the most perfect oil is no oil. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this give and take trying to find that perfect spot where you have so little friction that you either don't need to add oil because there's no wear or very little wear, uh, or you can find a way that your oils last longer. Okay. How do you do that? that Oil changes, you will have issues as well. Right. So you're talking about like introducing synthetics and things like that to, to make the oils last longer? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. All right, Gary, on you were saying. So you want the escapement to have as little friction in it as possible, mm-hmm. uh, because the less friction you have in it, the less error you're going to have uh, as the amplitude decreases in your watch. Okay. Now- and amplitude decreases as the wind goes down. Explain explain that in layman terms. I mean, when the wine goes down, it sounds like to me the watch is less accurate. Is that correct? It can be. It can be, okay. Shouldn't be. Uh-huh. But it can be. So explain go back to that amplitude thing and let's let's break it down so that let's say like, you know, uh someone like I can understand. <laughs> so as your balance wheel oscillates, it's going back and forth. Right. The amplitude is how much. Mm-hmm. So Your amplitude is how far that balance wheel travels back and forth. Mm, Okay. So if it's not traveling very far, you can have problems with accuracy. Okay. You want to have good amplitude. That means that there's very little friction between your power source, um, you you know, your energy source, which is the mainspring, Mm -hmm. and your balance wheel, your oscillator. Um, which is where you're going to regulate the time. Okay. So, as you can imagine, over time, the oils that are on the components leading from your power source to your balance wheel, as they dry up and become gummy, you're going to have more friction. Sure. And you are going to have less amplitude, which will magnify any imperfections in... Uh, things like poising, getting everything balanced in your wheel. Mm-hmm. It has to do uh, when you when you mount tires on a car. Right. You need to balance them by adding weights, things like that. Same thing happens with balance wheels. We need to add material depending on the type of the type of balance wheel. You can add material by adding washers, weight washers, and, and rings like that. You can also remove material by uh, by taking little uh, metal shavings off the base of the the wheel or off of screws that are on the wheel, different things. Okay, so is that indicative of quality if you're going to have to do something like that? I mean, it looks like I've yes. got one here. It looks like it's got three screws on one end or whatever they are. I mean, weights, whatever, but it doesn't look like it's a very high quality piece in comparison to say something like here. Uh, I don't know exactly what it looks, maybe like a Gosuta, but not not as uh, counterbalanced or whatever, if that's the right term. So, carry on. Yeah, so uh, you're going to manipulate the weight mm-hmm. of the rim of your balance wheel so that your poising is, is better. Got it. Uh, so, everything being done properly, you should have very little error that is introduced timing wise into your watch, even if the amplitude goes down. Okay. But nothing is perfect. So sure. over time, as your amplitude goes down, you will inevitably see timing issues. 
and your amplitude will go down to a point that is not great for the watch when those oils wear out. Right. And that's where another place that the coaxial really shines, right? Is the amplitude isn't really that much of an issue? Not. That's not really uh, correct. Mm -hmm. So what was so like I had discussions with people, for example, and they were like, well, the coaxial is better because it doesn't really lose the coaxial movement doesn't really lose its accuracy uh, if the watch is, let's say, at full wind or half wind or low wind. So what were they talking about? Uh, so the coaxial is a direct impulse escapement. Mm hmm. Meaning that you're not translating your impulse through the pallet fork. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. All right. So when the balance wheel comes around on a Swiss lever escapement, there is a jewel that hits the pallet fork mm -hmm. and unlocks the pallet fork. Okay. It then will move faster than the pallet fork is moving and it will hit the pallet fork again or it, i mean sorry the pallet fork will then hit the balance wheel right. i had that back um i'm trying to like in my mind I'm, <laughs> I'm in a little watch movement or a large watch movement i guess watching these parts whiz by my head <laughs> right and that's in in the back so just i guess so that we can make this a little bit more visual and people obviously are they're, they're going to see this graphic that i've pulled up here so you're talking about where the pallet fork actually connects well it doesn't necessarily connect but there is a little jewel uh on the the balance spring right or, or on the balance and that's actually making the connection with the pallet and the pallet is going left to right left to right yeah so i'll, I'll show you with my fingers you have the yeah, the yeah. fork has a tail end right and you have the balance wheel. I've got it on its side so you can see it. Right. And essentially, this will be spinning back and forth like this as the balance wheel oscillates. Right, right, right. It will, come in, it, will it will hit, and it will unlock. Right. And your pallet fork will move faster on uh -huh. the drop and hit that jewel okay. to put energy back into the balance wheel. Interesting. Okay. So... You're, you're getting the energy into the balance wheel through the pallet fork. Got it. Whereas a coaxial is going to impart that energy back into your balance wheel mm -hmm. without your pallet fork. Got it. See so it's directly out. impulsing your balance wheel with the escape wheel or some kind of intermediate wheel. Trying to pull some up. Uh, I, it's hard to pull anything up that basically kind of explains the pallet fork versus the coaxial. I mean, here's here's a picture, but unfortunately you can't see it. But I guess, all right, so if you guys really want to see what a coaxial is versus, uh, let's say, like a Swiss lever, the more, if you really want to see what's, uh, what's one that's not being used much anymore, the detent escapement, that was awesome. That was super cool. And there's actually a, a watch, uh, I think Urban Jurgensen still makes a detent escapement for a wristwatch. I think they do. We can look that up. Uh, but yeah, anyway, go on like uh, go on YouTube and try to search something for a representation of how the balance works on the uh, Swiss lever escapement and on the coaxial. But Cameron, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, so I mean, that's uh, that's going to be the one of the differences mm -hmm. with your uh, coaxial escapement. Okay. Now, there are other direct impulse escapements. Direct impulse is the is really the best way to do it. Um, it's also very expensive because the tolerances in order to get a direct impulse mm -hmm. are very tight. You have an example for me for a direct impulse? AP escapement is direct impulse. Which one? Audemars Piguet? Uh, it's just called the AP escapement. Oh, they have their own escapement? Yes. Huh. I did not know that. Let's pull that up. Which is a good indicator of uh, how complex it is to manufacture, oh. because they don't—they have their own escapement and they don't put it in all of their watches. Uh -huh. uh, and the watches that it is in are over six figures. Yeah, the Jules Audemars looks like it's uh, it's in that movement or in that watch. Wow, that's a really interesting one. So, okay, it, can you explain that a little bit further? Obviously, it looks like there's less. I mean, the pallet fort is basically non-existent for the most part. I mean, it kind of looks like a pallet fort, but not really. Uh, all right. So on that 
escapement, I would say we did an escapement issue or an escapement episode mm-hmm. uh, in last year's season that I would recommend watching for the escapement stuff where we go over a bunch of those different escapements. Um, I'm pretty sure we mentioned the AP escapement in there and went through it. But if you're interested in the escapements, that episode is where it's at. Yeah. It has all like the visuals and the details. And I honestly don't think that there are any dramatic newcomers in the escapement world uh, since we recorded that episode. Yeah. When we did the episode, there was one wildly new one, which is just a, an insane escapement. Uh, I believe that came from Parmigiani. Uh, par- yeah, Parmigiani did a crazy one, and then Zenith also came out with one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure we included both of those ones in that episode, too. Okay, so okay. guys, go for back into the uh, the log there. and that archive out. Yeah, I was just saying to check that episode out for the escapement stuff. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we've got that. Now let's talk a little bit further about the escapements, and then we'll kind of like wrap everything up because we're, we're at that time now. Uh, when it comes to escapements, like the differences in power transmission, we've talked about that. Like, let's talk about efficiency more so, because yes, you, we were talking about like frequency, um, not frequency. Uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, gear ratios? Gear ratios, no, it's uh, the rubbing. What happens when it rubs? Friction? Friction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about friction. So which one is the least friction style and, uh, of escapement and does that do anything when it comes to the power transmission? Is it is it better or worse, let's say, for a barrel? Like, are you going to get more of a power reserve out of one particular escapement or not? The amount of friction in your standard watch is extremely low to begin with. Okay. So you really aren't going to see massive changes in power reserve or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Just based on changing the style of escapement. Got it. Okay. All right. What you will see is that changing from a high beat escapement to a low beat or what would be considered a, a standard beat rate could add a substantial amount of power reserve. So you will notice if you look at a lot of the new watches that have come out uh, over the past two years Mm -hmm. uh, from brands that are connected to the Swatch Group. Mm -hmm. They are using a new line of movements. And this line of movements is based on your typical ETA movements, your 2892s, 2824s, 7750s, It's based on these movements, but what they've done is they've lowered the beat rate. Okay. To a 21.6 beat rate, which allows them to increase the power reserve. Mm. And they're doing so mainly for the increase in power reserve, and they're able to maintain the accuracy of the watch Mm. with that decrease. They're not losing any accuracy because of the upgrades in manufacturing technology. Got it. Now we're going to wrap it up, everything up. So we, we've talked about power transmission. We've talked about uh, the cogs inside. We've talked about the barrels and the mainsprings and all that good stuff. Now let's talk about modules, right? So the module is essentially something that you put on top of the movement. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the Dubois de Prize is probably the most used module. Yeah, they're one of the the oldest uh, and largest module manufacturers. Right. Okay. So when you're adding stuff on uh, for a module, now, do you have to kind of reverse engineer? We were talking about the main plate, right? Do you have to go back and kind of change things up when you're putting a module up? Or is it basically just, hey, plug and play? Like, you, there are modules for every single kind of movement, like a 2892, a 6497. How does that work? Uh... What's the question exactly? The question is, is if I want, let's say I have like a base 6497 movement, right? Yes. Um, And I want to put, let's say, a power reserve indicator on it. I'm actually going to pull up a watch. I think it's a great example. It's the Maurice Lacroix uh, uh, Lunar Retrograde Calendar. And it's got like all of these different modules or all all of these different complications on it. And all it is, it's a modular movement because it's 6497 base. 
So I'm looking at the back of, let's say, a 6497. I'm looking at the back of this Maurice de Croix, and they look pretty close, but there are some differences. Now, my question is, is what do you have to do in order for that watch or that movement, rather, to accept that module? Is Are you completely redoing certain things? Like, are you messing with the main plate at all? Or is it basically kind of something where Dubois de Pry has so much experience with the 6497 that they're like, here, here's your module, and you can just tack it on? Ideally, you shouldn't have to change anything with your base movement. Okay. So if you have a, a fully finished, assembled uh, movement, the module should connect directly to that through your hour wheel. So you will essentially, instead of placing your hour wheel on the dial side of your watch, you will place a module with a special hour wheel, and it will, your hour wheel will power the functions in the module. Let's say I'm Maurice Lacroix. What do I have to do in order to get that module from, let's say, Dubuis de Pry? Just basically tell them, like, hey, we have a 6497 movement, and we want these cal- uh, complications on it. And what does that module do in terms of, like, how that 6497 works? Because if you take a look at this lunar retrograde here, I mean, you've got a power reserve. So what what are you doing to compensate all of these uh, complications because obviously that takes so much energy and it's going to deplete that mainspring a lot faster or, or is it not anything that you really do it's just you're going to have a, a lower power reserve on this thing so if it has a power reserve uh, it's unlikely that that is a simple module mm-hmm. because the power reserve is going to need to tie into your barrel arbor somehow okay uh, so you're going to need a special barrel arbor or a special barrel complete to make that happen. Okay. I don't know the exact movement you're talking about, but simpler to talk about something I do know. Um, If you look at, say, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak offshore chronograph, you're going to have a, in the new versions, Mm -hmm. 3120 movement. Let's pull that up. Which is an automatic movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, Time and date. That's all they need. Okay. It's a stable, solid, well-built, beautifully decorated movement. And Dubois de Pra manufactures a great, reliable, solid chronograph mechanism that attaches to the front of that movement. Got it. So it's it's essentially the same movement as well. I mean, it is the same movement as like, like a fifteen five hundred, and then they're putting the module on top. Yeah. So the the same thing that'll be in your Royal Oak chronograph. Mm-hmm. Um, well, actually, I take that back. The Royal Oak chronograph is going to be a different movement. That one is uh, an integrated chronograph, mm-hmm. where the movement is a chronograph movement. The movement that is in the Royal Oak offshore chronograph right the 31 as the movement that is in your regular royal oak got it got it with no chronograph got it okay all right yes they're taking a, a movement that they produce and it's a really awesome tool to have access to modules because then instead of producing a chronograph that fits that watch and also a dual time, you know, uh, whatever that fits this watch and uh, something else that fits this watch and producing it in a tenth of the quantity, they can produce a larger quantity of that one particular automatic movement so that they can gain uh, some economy by scale and save money, which translates into better prices for the consumer. Sure. Which I like. <laughs> I think it's more fun to be able to have more options at a, a more reasonable price. Not to say Automar PGA is a reasonably priced. Yeah. <laughs> but they did not have access to modules and made every single complication integrated into every single movement and produced just a handful of these and a handful of those and a handful of these. Right. You would see six-figure pricing across the board 
instead of, you know, something in the 15s. Yeah, yeah. So, and you're looking like d- double the price basically for for the, uh, the actual in-house chronograph by by Audemars Piguet because you've, you've, you've for these the Royal Oaks the offshores are probably what like you said yeah somewhere around fourteen fifteen thousand pre owned right and um, uh, it should be around twenty one or something like that which one it should be around twenty one thousand okay well I'm talking about like it might be more. yeah 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 on the on the lowest end like a rubber clad's probably going to be somewhere around like fourteen to seventeen thousand depending on condition I guess but uh, I mean are you are you quoting used or yeah 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 we're talking about yeah. Yeah, but new, yeah, you're you're looking at uh, around twenty one, twenty two thousand, right? Modules are are an awesome way to have access to more complications without having to pay six figure pricing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's the most difficult thing to do with a module? And you were talking about the power reserve, where you kind of have to mix things up a little bit. So, is the power reserve the most difficult of all the complications out there? No, I mean, the power reserve is just an oddball one because you've got to you have to somehow tie into your barrel. Right. How does that work? So explain the whole power reserve thing. You're tying into the barrel. What does that mean? Uh, well, you need to know how many turns are left in your barrel, mm-hmm. essentially. Okay. And that's how the power reserve ind- indicator works, is it shows you how many turns are up, down, whatever? Well, there's the, again, there's multiple ways of doing it. <laughs> do the uh, most common. Let's do the most common but, one. Uh. Again, there's not like a most common, but there are <laughs> there's two ways of doing it. And you're essentially adding components around your barrel so that you can then add a hand. Mm. Uh, and these components will show you where in your wind you are, whether it's full, half, or low. Um, it's usually not accurate to like you know, in 20 minutes, your watch is going to stop or anything like that. But it's just, it gives you an idea. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So moon, moon phases and things like that. How do, how do you usually load, like, how are those usually implemented? And is it, is it, it's again, everything is power transmission, right? Um, but explain that a little bit further. Yeah. Well, you have, you have a wheel on the front side of your watch that turns, Mm -hmm. uh, one rotation, every 12 hours so you know that that's a given you're gonna have that that's your hour hand so from there you can just add more wheels you okay. add more wheels and get the ratios you want um you know you want to add an am pm indicator you can go ahead and do that just add a wheel out of hand uh and it's going to go around with your hour hand and you know at one point it's going to be in a dark part of a circle and the other time it's going to be in a light part of a circle right so you can add all of these things onto the front of the movement uh and there's the main two ways to do it you have a module that attaches to the front and has all of the components within that module okay or you have a different main plate and that main plate is what you would connect those parts to okay if you have a different main plate, that costs more, typically. Unless it happens to be a simple modification to an existing main plate to add those components. Right. If you have to make that main plate from scratch or have it really significantly different so that it's being made specifically for this project, it will be significantly more expensive than it would be to just get a module. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Is there anything you want to add? I mean, I'm kind of out of questions. I mean, that pretty much explains how the movement is working and what the module is doing, all that good stuff. So is there anything you want to throw in there? Um, I mean, the automatic mechanism is a good one. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So you have manual and you have automatic. Right. Manual. You turn the crown and you wind up the, uh, the mainspring. So you are the energy source. Your hand turning is where the energy comes from. And then you store that energy in the barrel. Sure. If you have an automatic watch, the energy is coming from your movement. Just, you know, throughout the day, talking with your hands. Right. Whatever it is, uh, the energy is coming from that. And there is a weight that is moving back and forth inside your watch that is doing the winding for you. Okay. Same system behind that. 
the barrel is being wound and you are storing your energy in the barrel. You then have your um, counting transmission, which is going to be your gear train. Okay. You're going to have your, um, your distribution and your escapement. So the distribution of, of all of that uh, and the regulation in your hairspring and your balance. Got it. Okay. All right. So basically, essentially what you're doing is you are adding an additional kind of in crown, basically, for the most part. It's kind of like a second crown on the inside. Whereas with a manual movement, all you have is one source of power transmission or an, a power adding, we'll say. Uh, and with the oscillating weight, what it does is it replicates basically the movement that you're doing with the crown, just does that kinetically. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. So you have to think about it. Yeah. And as far as I know, there's no other way to power up a watch unless, of course, again, you're looking at something like a Grand Seiko with the high beat stuff that they have, the, uh, you know, the hybrid movements, we'll call them. The lead, man, the Japanese love their hybrid stuff. Yeah. Well, when you get into that, you have a different, um, you have a different energy accumulator, basically. Right. Instead of accumulating energy in a regular barrel, it's a little different. Yeah. But it's still... The principle is the Still same. Still got a lot of the same stuff. Yeah, the principle is the same. You need a source. That's, uh, it's like there is no source outside of like, obviously, we're not going to go too much into physics here, but let's just keep it very, very simple. In order for you to start something, you need another power source. In a car, you have your battery. Uh, if you guys take a look at like old, old cars, there's always someone that's going outside to crank it. You, you need something to give you that initial push. There's nothing really, unless, like, you, even with a car, a modern car, the starter gives that initial push, but it needs that power source, which is your battery. So that's essentially what we're talking about here, is you, you have to have the initial push. Uh, and, you know, if you guys have an automatic watch, please, 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 if this is your first kind of foray into watches and you want to start it, don't grab and shake the crap out of it. Actually start winding it and then wear it through the day and then it'll, you know, It'll power up a little bit more as you wear it. So that's a yeah, PSA. The though. autopilot mechanism is not designed to wind your watch. Right. It's designed to it keep it designed, keep it wound up, right? Gain the power in the watch. Right. Right. So don't put don't put your watch on that's not running and expect it to to run well. Uh, you need to wind it up and then wear it. Right. And if you wear it, it will keep itself wound. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, like we're, we're talking about cars, right? You have that consi consistent power yeah. source. You have the alternators, you've got your starters and things like that. For all your car people out there. All right, yeah. so we've got the uh, the winding down. What else do we have? Do, are, we, are we missing anything? I don't think so. I think that's a pretty good uh, pretty good starter episode for, for anyone who's interested in all the little details in a movement. Yeah, 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 yeah are more interested in we could always do another follow-up episode if we get some questions about it yeah and if you guys have questions you guys know where to reach us on uh, the instagram actually we'll do the post we'll, why not let's do the plugs right now so you go sh you shoot first yeah find me on uh, instagram weiss watch company or you can find me personally uh cameron m weiss right on instagram okay good deal so you guys check out weisswatchcompany.com uh, get yourself a, a field watch. Get yourself a Weiss watch, period. They're kick-ass. Trust me on this. And if you don't want a Weiss watch, or if you already have one, go over to uh, Crown & Caliber. Check out their inventory. It is robust. I'll tell you that. There are watches for every kind of occasion. My Instagram is really simple, at Road Stories Mike. If you guys haven't, check out my old podcast, Road Stories Podcast, and also On Time. There is some really fun stories with, uh, with other watches that, that comes with On Time as well. And that's it.